This is a short story called William and Mary by Roald Dahl. William Pearl did not leave a great deal of money when he died, and his will was a simple one. With the exception of a few small bequests to relatives, he left all his property to his wife. The solicitor and Mrs. Pearl went over it together in the solicitor's office, and when the business was completed, the widow got up to leave. At that point, the solicitor took a sealed envelope from the folder on his desk and held it out to his client. I have been instructed to give you this, he said. Your husband sent it to us shortly before he passed away. The solicitor was pale and prim, and out of respect for a widow, he kept his head on one side as he spoke, looking downward. It appears that it might be something personal, Mrs. Pearl. No doubt you'd like to take it home with you and read it in privacy. Mrs. Pearl accepted the envelope and went out into the street. She paused on the pavement, feeling the thing with her fingers. A letter of farewell from William? Probably. Yes. A formal letter. It was bound to be formal. Stiff and formal. The man was incapable of acting otherwise. He had never done anything informal in his life. My dear Mary, I trust that you will not permit my departure from this world to upset you too much, but that you will continue to observe those precepts which have guided you so well during our partnership together. Be diligent and dignified in all things. Be thrifty with your money. Be very careful that you do not, etc., etc. A typical William letter. Or was it possible that he might have broken down at the last moment and written her something beautiful? Maybe this was a beautiful tender message, a sort of love letter, a lovely warm note of thanks to her for giving him 30 years of her life and for ironing a million shirts and cooking a million meals and making a million beds. Something that she could read over and over again, once a day at least, and she would keep it forever in the box on her dressing table together with her brooches. There is no knowing what people will do when they are about to die, Mrs. Pearl told herself, and she tucked the envelope under her arm and hurried home. She let herself in the front door and went straight to the living room and sat down on the sofa without removing her hat or coat. Then she opened the envelope and drew out the contents. These consisted, she saw, of some fifteen or twenty sheets of lined white paper, folded over once and held together at the top left-hand corner by a clip. Each sheet was covered with a small, neat, forward-sloping handwriting that she knew so well, but when she noticed how much of it there was, and in what a neat business-like manner it was written, and how the first page didn't even begin in the nice way a letter should, she began to get suspicious. She looked away. She lit herself a cigarette. She took one puff and laid the cigarette in the ashtray. If this is about what I am beginning to suspect it is about, she told herself, then I don't want to read it. Can one refuse to read a letter from the dead? Yes. Well, she glanced over at William's empty chair on the other side of the fireplace. It was a big brown leather armchair, and there was a depression on the seat of it, made by the buttocks over the years. Higher up, on the backrest, there was a dark oval stain on the letter where his head had rested. He used to sit reading in that chair and she would be opposite him on the sofa, sewing on buttons or mending socks or putting a patch on the elbow of one of his jackets. And every now and then a pair of eyes would glance up from the book and settle on her, watchful but strangely impersonal, as if calculating something. She had never liked those eyes. They were ice blue, cold, small, and rather close together, with two deep vertical lines of disapproval dividing them. All her life they had been watching her, and even now, after a week alone in the house, she sometimes had an uneasy feeling that they were still there, following her around, staring at her from doorways, from empty chairs, through a window at night. Slowly she reached into her handbag and took out her spectacles and put them on. Then, holding the pages up high in front of her so that they caught the late afternoon light from the window behind, she started to read. This note, my dear Mary, is entirely for you, 
and will be given you shortly after I am gone. Do not be alarmed by the sight of all this writing. It is nothing but an attempt on my part to explain to you precisely what Lanny is going to do to me, and why I have agreed that he should do it, and what are his theories and his hopes. You are my wife, and you have a right to know these things. In fact, you must know them. During the past few days, I have tried very hard to speak with you about Landy, but you have steadfastly refused to give me a hearing. This, as I have already told you, is a very foolish attitude to take, and I find it not entirely an unselfish one either. It stems mostly from ignorance, and I am absolutely convinced that only if you were made aware of all the facts, you would immediately change your view. That is why I am hoping that when I'm no longer with you and your mind is less distracted, you will consent to listen to me more carefully through these pages. I swear to you that when you have read my story, your sense of antipathy will vanish, and enthusiasm will take its place. I even dare to hope that you will become a little proud of what I have done. As you read on, you must forgive me, if you will, for the coolness of my style, but this is the only way I know of getting my message over to you clearly. You see, as my time draws near, it is natural that I begin to burn with every kind of sentimentality under the sun. Each day, I grow more extravagantly wistful, especially in the evenings, and until I watch myself closely, my emotions will be overflowing onto these pages. I have a wish, for example, to write something about you and what a satisfactory wife you have been to me through the years. And I am promising myself that if there is time, and I still have the strength, I shall do that next. I have a yearning also to speak about this Oxford of mine where I have been living and teaching for the seven, past 17 years, to tell something about the glory of the place, and to explain, if I can, a little of what it has meant to me to have been allowed to work in its midst. All the things and places that I loved so well keep crowding in on me now in this gloomy bedroom. They are bright and beautiful as they always were, and today, for some reason, I can see them more clearly than ever. The path around the lake in the gardens of Worcester College, where Lovelace used to walk. The gateway at Pembroke. The view westward over the town from Magdalen Tower. The Great Hall at Christchurch. The Little Rockery at St. John's, where I have counted more than a dozen varieties of Campanula, including the rare and dainty C. Wallensteinia. But there, you see, I haven't even begun and already I'm falling into the trap. So let me get started now and let you read it slowly, my dear, without any of that sense of sorrow or disapproval that might otherwise embarrass your understanding. Promise me now that you will read it slowly and that you will put yourself in a cool and patient frame of mind before you begin. The details of the illness that struck me down so suddenly in my middle life are known to you. I need not waste time upon them, except to admit at once how foolish I was not to have gone earlier to my doctor. Cancer is one of the few remaining diseases that these modern drugs cannot cure. A surgeon can operate if it had not spread too far, but with me, not only did I leave it too late, but the thing had the effrontery to attack me in the pancreas making both surgery and survival equally impossible. So here I was with somewhere between one and six months left to live, growing more melancholy every hour, and then all of a sudden comes in Landy. That was six weeks ago, on a Tuesday morning, very early, long before your visiting time, and the moment he entered I knew there was some sort of madness in the wind. He didn't creep in on his toes, sheepish and embarrassed, not knowing what to say, like all my other visitors. He came in strong and smiling, and he strode up to the bed and stood there looking down at me with a wild, bright glimmer in his eyes, and he said, William, my boy, this is perfect. You're just the one I want. Perhaps I should explain to you here that although John Landy has never been to our house, and you have seldom, if ever, met him, I myself have been friendly with him for at least nine years. I am, of course primarily a teacher of philosophy. But as you know, I've been lately been dabbling a good deal in psychology as well. 
Landy's interests and mine have therefore slightly overlapped. He is a magnificent neurosurgeon, one of the finest, and recently he has been kind enough to let me study the results of some of his work, especially the varying effects of prefrontal lobotomies upon different types of psychopaths. So you can see that when he suddenly burst in on me Tuesday morning, we were by no means strangers to one another. Look, he said, pulling up a chair beside that bed. In a few weeks, you're going to be dead, correct? Coming from Landy, the question didn't seem especially unkind. In a way, it was refreshing to have a visitor brave enough to touch upon the forbidden subject. You're going to expire right here in this room, and then they'll take you out and cremate you. Bury me, I said. That's even worse. And then what? Do you believe you'll go to heaven? I doubt it, I said. Though it would be comforting to think so. Or hell, perhaps. I really don't see why they should send me there. You never know, my dear William. What's all this about? I asked. Well, he said, and I could see him watching me carefully. Personally, I don't believe that after you're dead you'll ever hear of yourself again, unless... And here he paused, and smiled and leaned closer. Unless, of course, you had the sense to put yourself into my hands. Would you care to consider a proposition? The way he was staring at me, and studying me, and appraising me with a queer kind of hungriness, I might have been a piece of prime beef on the counter, and he had brought it and was waiting for them to wrap it up. I'm really serious about it, William. Would you care to consider a proposition? I don't know what you're talking about. Then listen, and I'll tell you. Will you listen to me? Go on, then, if you like. I doubt I've got very much to lose by hearing it. On the contrary, you have a great deal to gain, especially after you're dead. I'm sure he was expecting me to jump when he said this, but from, for some reason I was ready for it. I lay quite still watching his face and that slow white smile of his that always revealed the gold clasp of an upper denture curled around the canine on the left side of his mouth. This is a thing, William, that I've been working on quite for some years. One or two others here at the hospital have been helping me, especially Morrison, and we've completed a number of fairly successful trials with laboratory animals. I'm at the stage now where I'm ready to have a go with a man. It's a big idea, it may sound a bit far-fetched at first, but from a surgical point of view, there doesn't seem to be any reason why it shouldn't be more or less practicable. Landy leaned forward and placed both his hands on the edge of my bed. He has a good face, handsome in a bony sort of way, and with none of the usual doctor's look about it. You know that look. Most of them have it. It glimmers at you out of their eyeballs like a dull electric sign, and it reads... Only I can save you. But John Landy's eyes were wide and bright, and little sparks of excitement were dancing in the centers of them. Quite a long time ago, he said, I saw a short medical film that has been brought over from Russia. It was a rather gruesome thing, but interesting. It showed a dog's head completely severed from the body, but with the normal blood supply being maintained through the arteries and veins by means of an artificial heart. Now the thing is this, that the dog's head, sitting there all alone on a sort of tray, was alive. The brain was functioning. They proved it by several tests. For example, when food was smeared on the dog's lips, the tongue would come out and lick it away. And the eyes would follow a person moving across the room. It seemed reasonable to conclude from this that the head and the brain did not need to be attached to the rest of the body in order to remain alive. Provided, of course that a supply of properly oxygenated blood could be maintained. Now then, my own thought, which grew out of seeing this film, was to remove the brain from the skull of a human and keep it alive and functioning as an independent unit for an unlimited period after he is dead. Your brain, for example, after you are dead. I don't like that, I said. Don't interrupt, William. Let me finish. So far as I can tell from subsequent experiments, the brain is a particularly self-supporting object. It manufactures its own cerebral spinal fluid. The magic processes of thought and memory which go on inside it are manifestly not impaired by the absence of limbs or trunk or even of skull. 
provided, as I say, that you keep pumping in the right kind of oxygenated blood under the proper conditions. My dear William, just think for a moment of your own brain. It is in perfect shape. It is crammed full of a lifetime of learning. It has taken you years of work to make it what it is. It is just beginning to give out some first-rate original ideas. Yet soon, it is going to have to die along with the rest of your body simply because your silly little pancreas is lousy with cancer. No, thank you, I said to him. You can stop there. It's a repulsive idea, and even if you could do it, which I doubt, it would be quite pointless. What possible use is there in keeping my brain alive if I couldn't talk or see or hear or feel? Personally, I can think of nothing more unpleasant. I believe that you would be able to communicate with us, Landy said, and we might even succeed in giving you a certain amount of vision. But let's take this slowly. I'll come to all that later on. The fact remains that you're going to die fairly soon, whatever happens. And my plans will not involve touching you at all until after you're dead. Come on, William. No true philosopher could object to landing his dead body to the cause of science. That's not putting it quite straight, I answered. It seems to me there'd be some doubt as to whether I were dead or alive by the time you'd finished with me. Well, he said, smiling a little, I suppose you're right about that. But I don't think you ought to turn me down quite so quickly. Before you know a bit more about it, I said I don't want to hear about it. Have a cigarette, he said, holding out his case. I don't smoke. You know that. He took one himself and lit it with a tiny silver lighter that was no bigger than a shilling piece. A present from the people who make my instruments, he said. Ingenious, isn't it? I examined the lighter, then handed it back. May I go on? he asked. I'd rather you didn't. Just lie still and listen. I think you'll find it quite interesting. There were some blue grapes on a plate beside my bed. I put the plate on my chest and began eating the grapes. At the very moment of death, Landy said, I should have to be standing by so that I could step in immediately and try to keep your brain alive. You mean leaving it in the head? To start with, yes, I'd have to. And where would you put it after that? If you want to know, in a sort of basin. Are you really serious about this? Certainly I'm serious. All right, go on. I suppose you know that when the heart stops and the brain is deprived of fresh blood and oxygen, its tissues die very rapidly. Anything from, from four to six minutes and the whole thing's dead. Even after three minutes, you may get a certain amount of damage. So I should have to work rapidly to prevent this from happening. But with the help of the machine, it should be all quite simple. What machine? The artificial heart. We've got a nice adaptation here of the one originally devised by Alexis Carroll in Lindbergh. It oxygenates the blood, keeps it at the right temperature, pumps it in at the right pressure, and does a number of other little necessary things. It's really not at all complicated. Tell me what you would do at the moment of death, I said. What's the first thing you would do? Do you know anything about the vascular and venous arrangements of the brain? No. Then listen, it's not difficult. The blood supplies to the brain is derived from two main sources, the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries. There are two of each, making four arteries in all. Got that? Yes. And the return system is even simpler. The blood is drained away by only two large veins, the internal jugulars, so you have four arteries going up. They go up to the neck, of course, and the two veins coming down. Around the brain itself, they naturally branch out into other channels, but those don't concern us. We never touch them. All right, I said. Imagine that I've just died. Now what would you do? I should immediately open your neck and locate the four arteries, the carotids, and the vertebrals. I should then perfuse them, which means that I'd stick a large hollow needle into each. These four needles would be connected by tubes to the artificial heart. Then, working quickly, I would dissect out both the left and right internal jugular veins and hitch those also to the heart machine to complete the circuit. Now switch on the machine, which is already primed with the right type of blood, and there you are. The circulation through your brain would be restored. I'd be like that Russian dog. I don't think you would. 
for one thing, you'd certainly lose consciousness when you died, and I very much doubt whether you would come to again for quite a long time, if indeed you came to at all. But conscious or not, you'd be in a rather interesting position, wouldn't you? You'd have a cold, dead body in the living brain. Landy paused to savor this delightful prospect. The man was so entranced and bemused by the whole idea that he evidently found it impossible to believe I might not be feeling the same way. We can now afford to take our time, he said, and believe me, we need it. The first thing we'd do would be to wheel you into the operating room, accompanied, of course, by the machine, which must never stop pumping. The next problem... All right, I said, that's enough. I don't have to hear the details. Oh, but you must, he said. It is important that you should know precisely what is going to happen to you all the way through. You see, afterwards, when you regain consciousness, it will be much more satisfactory from your point of view if you are able to remember exactly where you are and how you came to be there. If only your own peace of mind and you should know that. You agree? I lay still on the bed, watching him. So the next problem would be to remove your brain, intact and undamaged, from your dead body. The body is useless. In fact, it has already started to decay. The skull and the face are also useless. They are both encumbrances and I don't want them around. All I want is the brain, the clean, beautiful brain, alive and perfect. So when I get you on the table, I will take a saw, a small oscillating saw, and with this I shall proceed to remove the whole vault of your skull. You'd still be unconscious at that point, so I wouldn't have to bother with anesthetic. Like hell you wouldn't, I said. You'd be out cold. I promise you that, William. Don't forget you died just a few minutes before. Nobody's sawing off the top of my skull without an anesthetic, I said. Lanny shrugged his shoulders. It makes no difference to me, he said. I'll be glad to give you a little procaine if you want it. If it will make you any happier, I'll infiltrate the whole scalp with procaine, the whole head from the neck up. Thanks very much, I said. You know, he went on, ex extraordinary what sometimes happens. Only last week a man was brought in unconscious, and I opened his head without any anesthetic at all and removed a small blood clot. I was still working inside the skull when he woke up and began talking. Where am I? he asked. You're in the hospital. Well... He said, fancy that. Tell me, I asked him, is this bothering you, what I'm doing? No, he answered, not at all. What are you doing? I'm just removing a blood clot from your brain. You are? Just like still, don't move. I'm nearly finished. So that's the bastard been giving me all those headaches, the man said. Lenny paused and smiled, remembering the occasion. That's word for word what the man said. He went on, although the next day he couldn't even recollect the incident. It's a funny thing, the brain. I'll have the procaine, I said. As you wish, William. And now, as I say, I take a small oscillating saw and carefully remove your complete calvarium. The whole vault of the skull. This would expose the top half of the brain, or rather the outer covering in which it is wrapped. You may or may not know that there are three separate coverings around the brain itself. The outer one called the dula matra, or dura. The middle one called the arachnoid. And the inner one called the pia mater, or pia. Most laymen seem to have the idea that the brain is a naked thing floating around in fluid in your head. But it isn't. It's wrapped up neatly in those three strong coverings. And the cerebrospinal fluid actually flows within the little gap between the two inner coverings, known as the subarachnoid space. As I told you before, this fluid is manufactured by the brain, and it drains off into the venous system by osmosis. I myself would leave all three coverings, don't they have lovely names, the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia? I leave them all intact. There are many reasons for this, not least among them being the fact that within the dura run, the venous channels that drain the blood from the brain into the jugular. Now, he went on, we've got the upper half of your skull off so that the top of the brain, wrapped in its outer covering, is exposed. The next step is a really tricky one. To release the whole package so that it can be lifted cleanly away, leaving the stubs of the four supply arteries and the two veins hanging underneath, ready to be reconnected to the machine. 
This is an immensely lengthy and complicated business involving the delicate chipping away of much bone, the severing of many nerves, and the cutting and tying of numerous blood vessels. The only way I could do it with any hope of success would be by taking a wrong jewer and slowly biting off the rest of your skull, peeling it off downward like an orange until the sides and underneath of the brain covering are fully exposed. The problems involved are highly technical and I won't go into them, but I feel fairly sure that the work can be done. It's simply a question of surgical skill and patience. And don't forget that I've had plenty of time, as much as I wanted, because the artificial heart would be continually pumping away alongside the operating table, keeping the brain alive. Now, let's assume that I've succeeded in peeling off your skull and removing everything else that surrounds the sides of the brain. That leaves it connected to the body only at the base, mainly by the spinal column and by the two large veins in the four arteries that are supplying it with blood. So what next? I will sever the spinal column just above the first cervical vertebra, taking great care not to harm the two vertebral arteries which are in that area. But you must remember that the dura, or outer covering, is opened at this place to receive the spinal column, so I'd have to close this opening by sewing the edges of the dura together. There'd be no problem there. 